reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. It strikes me that um, in considering the study of learning and memory, um, I think all three of us find ourselves in a uh, really fascinating phase of the field uh, that what really has intrigued us and brought us into the neurobiology of learning and memory is that we're interested in how human beings learn, how they acquire new information, how they hold on to it. But each of us has come into the field from a different experimental perspective. Mm -hmm. You, Tim, are working on Drosophila, and you, Pat, working on monkeys. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, Pat, when you first started, uh, whether you thought you'd be doing experiments that are as deeply involved in learning and memory as they have turned out to be. Well, actually, it, it comes as so somewhat of a surprise to me that I'm actually studying learning and memory in the way that we're studying it now. And um, in the early days when I began to study the cortex, the cerebral cortex and the highest area, the frontal lobes, I thought that it was impossible to understand the uh, neural basis of memory because I had been accustomed to the very widespread belief that this was too complex a subject, especially the cortical contribution to memory. And perhaps if you recall, in the, uh, even in the early 70s, there was great, uh, there was no real animal model of uh, what you're now studying in terms of uh, hippocampal contribution to memory. So I more or less accepted this dogma that, well, it's too complex. And I uh, thought, well, I'll just be satisfied with looking at more basic things and working out, for example, the anatomy or the connections of the frontal cortex or how it develops and when it develops and uh, such questions as that. And um, little by little, the information that we were gathering over these years uh, without our sights on, a, on understanding memory came together in such a way as they made me start thinking, well, what is this connection for? What is this doing? What is that doing? And uh, as we'll probably discuss during this conversation, a lot of things came together that made it really a wonderful opportunity and realization that we're studying the neural basis of a memory phenomenon. Now what about you? Your work is on, on let me just explore yeah. your yeah. own thinking a little bit first. Uh, your work is on, on prefrontal cortex. Right. Uh, now, I don't remember the history of that cortex sufficiently right. well. Were people aware of the fact that it might be involved in working memory, as you've been able to show recently? Well, actually, that's another very uh, penetrating question, because uh, another reason why I didn't think that we could be studying memory is that people were not thinking about the prefrontal cortex in terms of memory. Mm -hmm. They were mm -hmm. invoking the most, uh, you know, global concepts that, such as personality, planning for the future. This was the period just after the lobotomy era in which people uh, yes. were really impressed first of with, all, first of all, how little sometimes happened as a result of lesions. Well, that's interesting since we're having our conversation at Columbia and some of those studies that's were done here. here. The Greystone Project. Uh, there were several things happening. One is that um, it was after the frontal lobotomy um, era, and it was there was the widespread belief that the frontal cortex had nothing to do with cognitive or intelligent behavior, and that was very much supported by a very uh, little little abstract by. Uh, Donald Hebb, who otherwise is quoted all the time for being uh, having the seminal contribution to um, studying uh, conditioning and the basis neural basis of uh, conditioning, he had done a study in which he uh, 
obtained IQ scores of patients with frontal lobotomies and they had no change in their IQ scores and that just killed the field. Mm. That killed the idea that the frontal cortex had anything to do with these higher order things. So actually frontal lobe research went into a real decline probably on the basis of that one abstract uh, among, other, among other things and uh, there were, people were not studying it. So I was really out there all by myself continuing to study that, but again without the thought that it would lead to where it's led. Right. And now, um, the idea that working, the idea about working memory came forward when uh, actually the field of cognitive psychology became more cognitive. And they started to study memory processes in humans and to split apart what the conventional distinction between long-term and short-term memory. Now, I'm sure, as you know, uh, short-term memory was thought of as kind of an avenue into long-term memory, and it was interesting as a uh, entry point. But it wasn't thought of as, as having anything as a readout, exactly, or having any kind of dynamic quality or having a uh, function of its own other than serving long-term memory. But uh, people like Alan Baddeley, some in British uh, psychologists and others, uh, others before him, were, uh, came to the conclusion that short-term memory had, was something different and it could be dissociated from long-term memory. And they started to think of it as a more dynamic process. And there's not, I would say, there's not a great deal of agreement on what working memory is among the cognitive scientists right now. But at least one very important aspect of it is that it is um, thought of as a scratch pad and uh, a temporary memory system which, during which, uh, from which the information need not go into long-term memory, but can serve its own purpose. That is, uh, it's the ability to uh, recall information from long-term store, bring it to mind, and manipulate that information, such as in a mental arithmetic problem, yes. or actually in conversation, or in comprehension. It is the, um, I think of it this way, the glue which connects these moments in time so that you have mm -hmm. continuity to your conscious experience, so that, for example, you can recall the subject of the sentence by the time you get to the object of the sentence. And then as soon as you um, utter a sentence, you've completely forgotten it. As soon as you do a mental arithmetic problem, you forget it. So it is kind of like, uh, what shall I say, it, it's really information processing. And it, it's a, just as important that we erase as that we retain the information. So it's quite a different mechanism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than the long term. Yes. And maybe you yes. ought to uh, yes. talk about it. What I like about it is the conception that you presented, for example, uh, it, it, uh, in, in your last seminar in Copenhagen, uh, which I found so interesting is that it's really sort of the, uh, the output system right. for various kinds of memory process, that we can store it in long-term memory, but if I recall it, if I recall your name, Pat Goldman Rakic, it is through a frontal lobe mechanism. Uh, the other thing I find interesting about your work is that it brings together in primates and monkeys really right. a very advanced form, uh, sort of what we would call sort of a cognitive neuroscience approach. It brings together mm -hmm. fairly sophisticated advanced psychology mm -hmm. of the kind that one is clearly sees in you and me uh, with cellular neurobiology. Right. On the other hand, uh, uh, Tim Tully really represents the other extreme. He really. Uh, uh, works in a very simple animal and looks at how genes affect learning and behavior. And I wonder whether, you know, you might tell us how you got involved and how your approach melds with the others. Yeah. Uh, it's actually a, a, a good framework to answer that question. I, and to begin, I've always been involved. Uh, when I was an undergraduate in college, I took a course uh, on the genetic basis of behavior where the professor involved, Dr. Jerry Hirsch, worked on the genetics of learning and memory. Uh, 
and I was fascinated and intrigued from that moment on and have pursued it um, ever since. Having said that, the focus that we always had was genetics and what that means is that we fundamentally believed that genes that make proteins and other gene products had to in some way direct the biological process that ultimately gave rise to a functioning brain and to learning and memory processes. So it's been from what you might say the bottom up perspective that, that we've tackled the problem. Now focusing on genetics, what we have to have as an experimental tool is genetic manipulation and genetic tools um, to bring to bear on the problem. And, and in this century, the organism that has kind of stepped forward as one with a lot of genetic tools is the tiny little fruit fly, Drosophila. Uh, as powerful as they are for genetic tools, for a long time it was not uh, known that they could learn anything. Mm -hmm. And in the early 70s, finally a convincing demonstration that flies were capable of learning something emerged from Seymour Benzer's lab at Caltech. And to understand what that is and, and ultimately how it relates to, to memory, we have to step back to the beginning of the century when uh, a Russian by the name of Pavlov worked on dogs. And most people, I'm sure, have heard of Pavlov's dogs. What Pavlov did fundamentally was that he designed an experimental procedure that reduced learning down to a very basic aspect, which was the association of two stimuli in time. Mm -hmm. Now that's not the only form of learning, of course, but it was a basic element of a very fundamental kind of learning. And to me, the genius of what Pavlov did at the time was that he extracted the procedure so that it could be applied to any species, uh, from man down to the tiny fruit fly. I, I agree with you, and I think that uh, we don't hear enough, we don't hear Pavlov cited enough because, in fact, didn't he, isn't he the, one of the earliest to have brought uh, to our attention the coincidence of a input and a two stimuli coming together in time, yes. which is the basis of the association? Yes. But what he really did was he took the idea that yes. the empiricist yeah. philosophers were yeah. dealing with, that learning involves an association of ideas, and did what any good biologist yes. did. He put it into a context yes. when we yes. can really study it, yes. and it showed that you can study it by associating stimuli. But uh, I think he also emphasized the time, the temporal coincidence. Yes, yes. In, a, in a way yes. that it, that no is one had really appreciated fundamental before. for right. what is now being studied in in physiological terms. Absolutely, and and what has emerged uh, in this century is first that this basic idea of associating two events in time is in fact extremely complex. Psychologists have spent uh, this century working out just mm -hmm. a myriad of little properties, we could say, of this kind of learning. And it has ramifications mm -hmm. into all different mm -hmm. kinds of tasks um, that we learn to do and that we learn not to do. That's one of the mm -hmm. fun aspects. Mm -hmm. The other that sort of emerged in this century as well is that many different kinds of organisms can do this very basic form of right. learning. And what I'm sure that we will hear um, of in detail from Eric in this conversation is that what that seems to represent now is that there are some very uh, conserved molecular events that underlie these simple changes um, involved with learning. And that also is what unites the molecular cellular approach of Eric and his group with that of the fly genetics approach, that genes are the molecules um, that can be inherited and, and passed on from generation to generation. Now to, to sort of uh, link this, your question to that of memory, um, what I can say from work that we've been doing in my lab in the last uh, several years is that it appears as though information processing of this simple form of learning in flies is following all the same kinds of rules as information processing in higher organisms in man. 
In particular, there seems to be a short-term memory, which is very uh, labile and can be disrupted mm -hmm. by various kinds of, of uh, insults or, mm -hmm. or distractions mm -hmm. from the environment. Mm -hmm. And that there's also a very long-lasting, very long-lasting for a fruit mm -hmm. fly, and much more stable form of memory that also exists in flies. And the fun of what mm -hmm. we do at this very mm -hmm. basic molecular mm -hmm. level is that work that Eric has been doing and the work in flies now seems to be following a similar course in the kinds of mechanisms, of mechanisms that are involved. And perhaps you would like to tell us a little bit sure. about that. As a matter of fact, one of the things that strikes me, although we didn't plan it this way, mm -hmm. is that there really is substantial overlap mm -hmm. between our work. There is. And we could really, in a very elementary way, present the coherent view of one component of the learning process. Uh, because many of the molecules that we work with in the plesia, the sea snail, are not only involved in Drosophila, but you've shown very nicely in the actions yeah. of dopamine, right. one of the major this transmitters in the mammalian what's brain, happening now. Uh, activates the same second messenger system as are involved in fruit fly right. and the plesia and shows the basic universality of biological processes. So what's a second messenger system? We've been interested in, in cyclic AMP, but let me stick back a little bit, uh, that is, my work uh, relates really to what the two of you have mm -hmm. been talking about uh, as sort of a bridging system. I've been working on the snail, uh, a plesia, and my uh, lab has been interested in the question, what kinds of cellular changes occur in the nervous system when an animal learns? Uh, and we found that a critical thing that happens is that synaptic connections, the communication points between nerve cells change, uh, and that reinforcing stimuli of the kind that Pavlov describes uh, act to strengthen uh, connections, and they do it by activating intracellular messenger systems, and a particularly important one for certain kinds of learning is cyclic AMP. And uh, you, Tim, have shown very nicely in some of your experiments that mm -hmm. these are involved in certain kinds of learning processes. And there is also the evidence from Pat's work mm -hmm. that that is involved. Now, needless to mm -hmm. say, in something as complicated as the brain, other second messengers are also involved, and there are various kinds of learning processes that use other second right, messenger systems. Right. You know, it strikes me another thing that we all have in common is a reductionistic attitude mm -hmm. to what we're studying. Mm -hmm. And yet, without losing sight of the uh, levels uh, from that relate to what we're studying, and um, I think it's really exciting that um, we know in the mammalian brain about, uh, say, the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, and uh, that when an animal, such as a monkey, and I suppose even a rat, and certainly a human, does a memory test, and perhaps uh, particularly a working memory test, both the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex are activated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're part of a circuit. And uh, you can start to imagine how input from, say, a cortical region to the hippocampus might be physiologically relevant to the events, the cellular events that happen in the hippocampus that could lead to long-term potentiation because after all that's the input right and um, and likewise the output could also uh, of the hippocampus to the cortical area is something that isn't studied enough I think we might agree looking at the mm. uh, work that's being done in behaving animals and, and mammals uh, has to be understood in terms of how you get information out Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing, we need to think more in terms of process, um, as some of our colleagues have emphasized, there's, there's consolidation, uh, which I think is very close to what you're studying, mm -hmm. there, and storage, and then what good is it if you can't get it out? You have to, you have to have it. a mechanism for you, uh, retrieving it, otherwise why store all, why should we store all this information if we don't have a way of reading it out, as you say, read out. And it occurs to me that the things that most people are interested in, like intelligence and intelligent behavior, actually comes down to understanding memory, because we could 
uh, my favorite definition of intelligence is the ability to bring the appropriate information to bear at the moment. And that's uh, how memory enters cognition. It's the range and pertinence of, the inform of all the information you have in, in your long-term store. What you bring out <laughs> is very significant to the, uh, uh, guiding the be behavior that you're going to engage in at any given moment. And sort the, of a selective yeah, retrieval. Yeah. Yeah. And even though it's important to have good memory, and which I must confess I don't have. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Nor I mean, it's important to be able to remember a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It's also important to remember the right things at the right moment mm -hmm. and to get into that, that storage box and bring it out. And that's where I think the cortical and hippocampal interactions are going to be tremendously important. Now, I know we don't have that in, in the uh, Drosophila, but that, uh, I, I think that the cellular mechanisms are apt to be very, very similar. Also, I think it's, it's useful to make sort of uh, the distinction between different forms of learning. And processes. And, and processes. For example, yeah. the distinction between implicit and explicit forms of learning. Oh, yes. I want uh, to talk about that. I mean, what Tim described very nicely before, Pavlovian's yeah. classical conditioning, which is sort of yeah. one of the higher forms right. of, uh, of implicit right. forms of learning, to which simple right. forms like sensitization, right. habituation belong, uh, don't involve hippocampus, probably right. don't necessarily yeah. involve frontal cortex. They involve the particular sense and motor system that is involved uh, and that can be studied yeah. in yes. any animal that has an evolved nervous system. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, uh, things uh, that involve remembrances about people, places right. and things, conscious participation, uh, involve hippocampus, right. temporal cortex and frontal cortex uh, and probably can only be studied or at yes. least best be studied uh, in, in mammals. I, I totally agree with that. Um, conception because um, I, I think that we all ha we all share in the basic mechanisms of uh, sensitization habituation and probably conditioning I would mm -hmm. I would assume but then when you come to this uh, higher order business it gets much new more elaborate. new structures come into question well, yeah. what's going to be interesting which I don't think mm -hmm. we're going to know for another yeah. five or ten years mm -hmm. is that it's perfectly conceivable that even though the circuitry is much more complicated and involves these newly evolved mm -hmm. structures like the hippocampus and association cortices that the cellular molecular mechanisms that are involved might still share mm -hmm. components in common for example one of the things that has always struck me and perhaps you would comment on this is that um, in the old work by Flexner, Barandas, and uh, Squire, and, mm -hmm. uh, and others, which looked at the inhibitors of mm -hmm. protein synthesis mm -hmm. and how it affected mm -hmm. long-term memory mm -hmm. without affecting short-term memory, that people looked at tasks that were both implicit and explicit. So here is a fundamental distinction about how long-term memory is stored compared to short-term memory is stored, suggesting that different molecular are you using the terms implicit and explicit as, as uh, a dichotomy? Conscious or? memory. The, yeah. the people yes. looked at tasks that seemed to, right. you know, in mammals, I including in primates, that, that n nevertheless you can peel off a long-term memory process mm -hmm. for remembering an object in space, right. uh, something that presumably involves hippocampus frontal cortex. Uh, but nonetheless can separate it off with a procedure that separates off Tim's form of long-term memory and the implicit form of long-term memory, mm -hmm. which are clearly, you know, implicit, simple, reflexive type of learning. So it's possible that the circuitry is mm -hmm. much more evolved, mm -hmm. uh, that there's much more parallel processing. Yes. But well, if you look at the synaptic mm -hmm. changes, mm -hmm. uh, that they may nonetheless follow the same rules in, in elaborate learning as in simple mm -hmm. forms of I learning. I think that's an interesting. The, one of the um, one of the points that I keep trying to emphasize, but apparently not very well, uh, not judging from your comment, but in general, is I want I want cell biologists to recognize a little bit more the difference between um, the working memory, which is basically a um, where where you really have to understand um, that. It's not going anywhere. It's evanescent. No, no, I, yes. I, I, I so, understand that. No, I know you do. I know you do. But uh, so I'm thinking the 
same kinds of molecular mechanisms and cellular mechanisms that are really underlying stamping in information might be different. I agree that the you know basic cellular machinery might be the same, but I think if we start to think, I, I just have the feeling that there could be a whole set of new mechanisms, maybe using the same alphabet, but going in a different direction. You, you may very well be right, but you're speaking about a, an additional variant to the memory process, that is the readout uh, yeah. the, the but you've I think been it's studying. a different thing. It, it may very yeah. well be. I mean, I think one could argue either mm -hmm. point. If I look at yeah. your beautiful results, I'm struck with the Which fact that you use <laughs> <laughs> dopamine for regulation yeah. and it works through a D1 yes. receptor oh, and that seems wonderful. to be cyclic yeah. AMP. So mm -hmm. even though he and I came into this room from a completely different direction, we immediately recognize your molecules as old friends. What, That's what, good. what I'm it glad. seems to be involved in flies are also biogenic yes. means as they yes. are in a plesia. So I, I think yeah. that even though you're dealing with a highly evolved, right. very special, almost human like working memory, uh, the molecules are nonetheless quite conserved. Now, the circuitry, which really gives the brain yeah. its distinctive. Uh, function is of course much more elaborate. You have many, many more pathways to interact in much more complicated ways. Uh, but and that, that allows this that process. That gives degrees of freedom that yeah. you know the right. molecules yes. can be used right. in now novel ways because of the fact that you right. have lots of you know reentrant pathways, etc. Right. That uh, right. that are present there. So that that seems to be implying in dr drawing this distinction between cellular processes and circuits that that the brain certainly of monkeys and of man is specialized anatomically that there are different regions of the brain that do different things mm -hmm. and that working memory in prefrontal cortex is that brain parts task mm -hmm. and as such has been designed to be that way that's my that's my theory now that uh, the prefrontal cortex evolved to carry out that process so right. um, and without it, you don't have uh, you don't have that process. You have all the other processes. You have long-term memory. You have mm -hmm. ad adaptation, habituation, all of that. But you're missing this extra component. And this is evident from looking at patients with frontal lesions, with monkeys with frontal lesions, and so on. Mm -hmm. But but it's um, it's really. Uh, 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 I think yeah. what you're saying is really quite fascinating because it really. Um, touches a point that I like most about the study of learning. Uh, what has always appealed to me about it, uh, or looking at it from the point of view of a cell biologist, is that it's, it's a wonderful problem from a cell biological point of mm. view, uh, yeah. because you uh, can see in it both universal mechanisms right. that cells use yes. for doing very mm. routine things, but you see it in a very special context. So often you can, uh, you can uncover really a novel manifestation Mm -hmm. of a general mechanism. And what you're saying is very much the same thing, right. that by looking at the frontal uh, cortex, you're going to see you know, nerve cells, but you're going to see them in a way that you don't see them in other parts right. of the brain because they're recruited, right. as you say, from an evolutionary point of view to solve this particular task. The really interesting, uh, another really interesting aspect is that uh, each system, there seem to be many different uh, parallel systems, each organized according to common principles. And uh, for example, I think that that makes it possible to see conservation also across species. So for example, mm -hmm. in the area of visual processing or odor processing, it's more apt to be similar between primates and uh, mice and rats and uh, aplesia and other uh, animals than in the area of semantic or linguistic yes, well, sure. or auditory. Mm -hmm, sure. But the principles might be uh, similar. In other words, if you worked out the basis of olfactory conditioning as mm -hmm. you are, they, they might have very great relevance to human olfactory conditioning. They're, they're really essentially, yeah. I think what we're all saying is they're really sort of two separate issues in, in, in the study of, of uh, memory. One is the cellular and synaptic mechanisms, right. and the other is the circuitry. Right. Uh, and the circuitry is likely to vary greatly 
for different learning tasks and for different species, certainly as you get to more mm -hmm. evolved learning, mm -hmm. but that the cellular mechanisms are likely to be shared. Especially for the conditioning, I think, and, yeah. for, and which I believe underlies many of uh, the declarative and non-declarative and implicit and all of that is based have, on Many have them associated features. That. It's I a very fundamental. I think that is very, very fundamental. Um, well, and the, uh, another idea that I was leading up to was that, that when you have a developing brain that does have specialization among the neurons and the circuits mm -hmm. within, it implies that there can be developmental influences and differences among neurons. Mm -hmm. So that another emerging uh, um, idea that all of us are contemplating is to what extent do these processes of learning and memory involve the same kinds of developmental phenomenon that established right. the brain in right. the first place. Yeah, that really uh, is probably a, a topic subject. for another, another yes. subject, but yeah. it is quite fascinating, yeah. and that yeah. is that, uh, and I, th I think I mentioned this to you in a conversation recently, uh, I really felt for the longest time, really until five or six years ago, mm -hmm. that the brain uh, was pre-programmed mm -hmm. uh, to develop along very precise ways, mm -hmm. and that the connections that we end up with in the adult brain are, are determined prior to birth. And we now realize that that in many parts mm -hmm. of the brain, not in all, certainly right. is true in the spinal cord, right. quite uh, precise connections, right. but in many parts of the brain that isn't true, right. that the connections are programmed in a very rough way and learning mechanisms are involved mm -hmm. in the fine tuning of those connections. Uh, so that the solution of learning not only uh, is important for memory processes, but ma may carry with it this extra bonus. Well, I think we should come back and talk about this in our next, <laughs> in our next meeting. But I, I did want to say one thing before we conclude, and that is the, the fact that we can be thinking about the cellular and molecular basis of memory. I really feel we owe a lot to you, Eric, because you inspired that this could be done, even though you really started it out, started out with the, you know, the sea slug and uh, and but you showed that it could be uh, you know it could be done in showing that it could be done that was a kind of a stimulus and a role model really and uh, in a way I think everybody many of us maybe even I am trying to emulate you in my own way in my own system so I think I just wanted to put that well, that's forward. very very nice Thank I hope you I very can much. get to the cellular basis of working memory. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I must say, I find the two of you an enormous uh, source of inspiration. Uh, you were one of the first Spencer Award winners That's at Columbia right. because That's we right. regard your work so highly. Mm -hmm. And I was delighted when Tim Tully moved to Cold Spring Harbor to have him close by. Yes, and certainly the nice work in Aplysia has benefited enormously from the work in Drosophila. Yeah. We, we so seem to be converging on you from both directions. You occupy the <laughs> middle ground of cells. Absolutely. Uh, the geneticists feel. are coming up and the fulfill. anatomists are coming yes, down. Yes, and I will feel, feel <laughs> fulfilled only when uh, they pl um, plan an experiment in aplasia based on our work in monkeys. <laughs> well, that is coming as soon That's as should, aplasia dopamine. develops a frontal cortex. Dopamine should be the connection. <laughs> that is <laughs> very good. <laughs> Why not dopamine? <laughs>